welcome to RISE Learning Machine Seminars. RISE is Sweden's research institute with 3,000 people working on topics spanning from bioeconomy to material science, built environment, transport, and digital systems. Specifically, the computer science department works on applied AI projects for the benefit of society, and we organize the weekly learning machine seminars as part of our Center for Applied AI Research. This meeting will be recorded, and if anyone wants to be removed from this recording, just let us know. Um, also, make sure to check out the collection of great talks on our YouTube channel. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce um, Victor Larsson, who is Associate Professor in the Mathematical Imaging Group at Lund University. Uh, Victor had his PhD from Lund University in 2018 with a thesis on computational methods for computer vision, minimal solvers, and convex relaxations. He then moved on to have a postdoc at, with uh, Mark uh, Polyphys at ETH Zurich. And uh, as I said, he's now back at Lund University with research interests uh, within structure from motion, visual lo localization, and SLAM. Uh, also integrating deep learning with classical geometry-based pipelines. And the topic today is mapping and localization for augmented reality. So with this said, Victor, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'll see if I can manage to share my screen. So now you see it full screen and uh, everything is good. Yes, looks great. Okay. So let me just remove this. Uh... Okay, so... Uh, the talk I will give today is about mapping and localization for AR. Uh, so this is work uh, that was mainly done while I was still at ETH Zurich, uh, and it was collaboration with the Mixed Reality and AI Lab uh, from Microsoft, uh, also in Zurich. Um, and as is usually the case, most of the actual work was done by the two PhD students you see here to the left, so Paul Edward and uh, Mihai Dismal. Um, so here is an outline of my talk. I will start with an overview of what do we mean by visual localization and mapping. I will talk a little bit about how this relates to augmented reality systems, and then a bit about how we benchmark and what kind of data sets is there for benchmarking this. Uh, and then I will talk about the data set we proposed and a benchmark we proposed at uh, ECCD uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, in mm -hmm. Tel Aviv. And then finally, some quick remarks about the results of these benchmarks, the limitations, and the open problems. Uh, but let's start with visual localization mapping. So there are a lot of applications where devices need to know where they are in the world. For example, in the top right here, we have this uh, augmented uh, reality navigation system from Google, where it's, it essentially overlays the uh, the uh, directions for navigation onto the sort of image taken by the camera, right? And to be able to do this, the device needs to know where it is in the world and how it is oriented, right? To realistically sort of tell you go, go right should mean uh, the right direction in the map as well. Uh, but you can imagine other scenarios, for example, if you have uh, construction workers have augmented reality devices and they show, for example, pipes overlaid that are underneath the earth, or they show where the building will show up and uh, things like this. Or like in robotics or autonomous systems, you have uh, robots that need to understand where they are in the world if they need to sort of drive in the same space as humans occupy, right? Um, now this positioning, we can sort of think about, uh, this can be done in different ways, right? So it can either be like, maybe we only need the 2D position. So we know like the position on a 2D map. So it can be the 2D translation or might, we might require the full six degree of freedom pose, so the rotation and translation. And this is generally with respect to a known reference frame. Now this reference frame can be like geo-reference, so it's sort of uh, in the world as well, of course. Um, and there are many ways you can do this. Like the most common way for sure is GPS, which most cell phones have now. Um, this of course mainly works outside and in you, if you are in these sort of urban canyons or like there's tall buildings around, uh, you get quite uh, inaccurate measurements due to this kind of multipath effects that are visualized in this image to the left. Uh, in other settings, you might have other sensor data, like in robotics, you might have wheel odometry or other kind of information from your motors telling you roughly how you have moved. Uh, 
this works in some application. Of course, it only gives you like a local positioning relative like how you have moved in the space. Uh, but it can also drift like if you have uh, wheel slippage and things like this. Uh, vision is a very attractive sensor in this uh, case because it gets you very accurate positioning as well as cameras are extremely cheap compared to many of these other sensors. Um, however, there are a lot of challenges with uh, doing visual localization. And these mainly come from the world is actually changing quite a lot. So here we see in the bottom, we see the same, um, the same area photographed like four, at four different instances throughout the year. And while we as humans can sort of realize by looking at these images for a while that this is actually the same position, if we want to design algorithms that should recognize that these are the same places, uh, you can understand that this is uh, far from trivial. Uh, but it's not only like these seasonal changes, we also have longer term structural changes in the world. Like we build buildings or um, we remove um, like cars drive around and things like this. So we have changes to the actual geometry as well and not only the appearance. Uh, now, if you wanna do visual localization, the first thing we need to do is build a map. Um, so in this context, this is through a process that is called structure for motion. And it's essentially, we have a collection of images and we want to recover the position of the cameras as well as some representation of the world, typically a sparse uh, 3D point cloud in SFM. Now, the way this works is that we first independently look at each image and we detect key points. So these are like particularly salient points that we think we might be able to detect in other images. And there's a bunch of methods for finding these, uh, perhaps the most prominent classical one is this sort of difference of Gaussians where you take peaks in these uh, differential Gaussian maps, which is used in the C key point detector. Uh, and then once we have our key points, we sort of look at the neighborhood around each point and we try to describe the local appearance uh, by computing some kind of descriptor uh, describing this. And then we can sort of take these detected points in multiple images, compare their descriptors, and establish matches between them. And this can be either just by taking the, the most similar descriptor or via more complex matching strategies. Then once we have these matches, we can sort of do this for multiple images and we can use them to recover both the camera geometry, so where the cameras were placed, as well as triangulating uh, 3D points. And once we have some initial idea of where things are, we can start optimizing these things such that we get more consistent projections into the images. So the points project closer to the uh, observed 2D locations. And this is sort of the basic idea of structure for motion or sparse structure for motion. Now, if we have a map, how do we do localization? So localization is then, if we get a new image, how do we figure out where this image was taken with respect to the map? Um, so typically you first do some kind of place recognition or like image retrieval to figure out roughly where you are. Uh, and then you sort of figure out the six degree of freedom uh, pose of the camera. And there's many different ways to do this and you can sort of group the methods by different uh, characteristics. But one way is to look at how we represent the map. Uh, so one approach is to only represent it in terms of images. So you have images together with their poses, and this sort of uh, fixes your coordinate system. Um, and then sort of like, you want to figure out where the query image is with respect to these fixed poses. Or you can do it uh, structure-based, so you have like a, a 3D model as well as the map, uh, uh, as the post map images. Uh, and then you can sort of split it along uh, the y-axis here. So if we do point matching, so what I just described previously, we identify key points and we match them uh, and use this to figure out the geometry, or there are also regression-based methods that train some network to take, uh, take the image as input and output uh, the pose. So in this case, in the image-only case, we would essentially train the network on the mapping images. We would input the mapping, mapping images and we would output the mapping post, right? And then when we get a query, we hope that we get something meaningful out. Uh, but there are also uh, methods sort of what's called scene coordinate regression, where you regress the absolute 3D coordinates of all the pixels in your uh, image. 
But by far for large scale localization, the 3D structure based localization is the most common. So what we do is essentially we find correspondences between our image and our map. And we use these to sort of figure out how we should place the camera so that when we project in, we get the correct pose. Uh, and this is done in some robust manner because we get a lot of outlier correspondences. Um, and of course, if your map is big, like how you establish these correspondences might be uh, tricky and you need sort of efficient algorithms to do this. So there was a quite popular one called Active Search from 2017, which does efficient 2D, 3D matching. Uh, but the current state-of-the-art methods are mainly based on this idea of hierarchical localization. Uh, and the idea is quite simple. So in the offline stage, in the mapping stage, uh, we take all of our mapping images, we extract both local features and the global features. So the global features are image level descriptors. So for every image, we associate an image descriptor. Uh, and then we perform the mapping as usual with structure promotion. And then in the online stage, when we get a query image, uh, we extract uh, a global descriptor, so an image descriptor, and we use this to figure out which mapping images are seeing roughly the same thing as my query image. And then I only match to these, and then I get uh, 2D, 3D correspondences for my query based on how I matched the my map images. Um, yeah, and of course, you can do this in many different ways, and you can use different detectors, different image retrieval, different matchers. Uh, currently, uh, most of these things have been replaced by deep networks. Um, so, for example, we used to rely a lot on CIF key points, but now we have learned detectors and learned matchers. Um, now, as I mentioned before, there are also these like end to end localization methods that sort of try to uh, learn this, usually called post-regression. Uh, and this can be formulated in different ways. You can do absolute post-regression. So it's an image goes in, post comes out. Um, or you can do relative post-regression. So you input both a one of the map images and the query image, and you regress the relative post between them. Um, and you can do uh, scene coordinate regression. So for every pixel you predict, the corresponding 3D point, and then you do uh, post estimation from this. Uh, now, these are sort of, they're interesting, but they're not working at the practical level yet, I would say. Uh, one very nice feature they have is that they have the ability to do a lot of scene compression. So in absolute post regression, the map is essentially encoded inside the weights of this network. So depending on how big this network is, this can actually be much, much smaller than storing all of the image descriptors, et cetera. Um, um, and you also have the possibility of learning like data dependent priors for the distributional poses. Um, so you can sort of, if you train on a distributional poses that is the same as you expect your queries to be, uh, this might work uh, better. Uh, but in general, we train these methods for scratch from each scene. So they don't really generalize, and currently they are quite a bit less accurate than structure-based methods. Okay, so how does this then fit into the context of augmented reality? So why do we even need localization in augmented reality? Well, if you only want to stick objects to the world, uh, then sort of the local slam performed by the device, or so the local tracking is enough, right? If I just want to place my hologram and I just want to move around it and look, that it sort of makes sense, um, then this is enough. But whenever we want to have like collaborative experiences, so if I have two users with augmented reality devices and I want to show the same thing to both users, I need to co-register their coordinate systems. So this is like a localization problem. Or if I want to do sort of, if I want to persist objects in time, so if I want to place an object and then come back tomorrow and have that object be there still, I need to be able to localize and figure out this is the same position I was in last time. So we need sort of a global reference frame that we can share across devices. Um, and there is a lot of people in the industry working on this as well. So there are also commercial localization services like uh, Microsoft Azure Spatial Anchors, Google has their BPS and also Niantic is doing some things with their flagship. Uh, and essentially, in their localization services, you take query images, you send them to the cloud, and they provide back 
uh, post. And this map that they use in the cloud then can be either built from AR devices or like from custom capturing rigs uh, in this case. Now localization for AR is quite different than in many other cases. Uh, it's not that we have adversarial users, but we the users don't aim to sort of capture nice images for localization. They just tend to put on their devices and they start them and then they expect to localize quite shortly after this. So whatever images you get from the camera, that's what you have to work with. Uh, and as you can see, some example here is to the right, like the motions we have are quite uh, challenging. Sometimes like if the user is standing next to a wall, some of your cameras can just look into a wall and see nothing. Uh, you still need to figure out something. Um, and we need to do this anytime. So essentially it needs to work. Uh, if I come to my office at night and I wanna use my augmented reality glasses, I expect them to work uh, even though the illumination is very different. Um, and if we wanna have this kind of collaborative experience across devices, we also need to do like cross mapping localization with very different sensor setups. Uh, and depending on your applications, you might have very high requirements for accuracy. Like for example, if you're if you're a builder and you have your augmented reality devices to sort of overlay where the water pipe is behind the wall and you're sort of going to drill into the wall, you want to avoid, like if the pipe is actually 10 centimeters down, this might be a problem for you, right? Uh, so we have, depending on the applications, quite high requirements for accuracy. Uh, we also have a lot of hardware limits. Uh, Especially, uh, there are limitations on how much you can run on device and how much latency the user can accept for this. Um, so there is some trade-offs, like um, how much compute you can actually spend on this and how much data you can actually send to the cloud to perform this localization. Um, but we also have a lot of opportunities. So it's not all negative. For example, uh, compared to a lot of visual localization literature, we have a lot of sensors. So we typically have a multi-camera rig giving us a very wide field of view. We have IMUs, we have radios, we have sometimes depth, we sometimes have GPS, uh, although in a lot of cases, this is not useful because we're indoors. Uh, but we also have temporal screens, uh, streams. So the sensors are essentially always recording. Uh, so we get a lot of temporal data that uh, uh, is quite useful. And we also get uh, local posts from the on-device tracking, right? So all of these uh, devices, they perform some kind of local odometry to figure out where the user is looking. There's also an opportunity to sort of build crowdsourced maps. So I, in an ideal world, uh, you would have a bunch of users running around with these devices and the images they use could then be used to build the maps as well as localized against them. So it was sort of like, it would be easier to bootstrap maps uh, instead of having like, um, explicit capturing sessions where people would go out and map a scene. Uh, you could just have the users uh, map them passively. Um, and you essentially get unlimited data in this sense. Okay, so now moving on to sort of how, how benchmarking and works in this case and how the existing data sets look. So the typical setup for this uh, benchmarking is that we have a set of mapping images that we capture at some time. We go back to the same space, we capture a set of query images at a later time, uh, and then we build a map and we ask, um, ask the algorithm or user to localize the query images. And then we sort of figure out how well did we localize compared to the, uh, to the ground truth process. Uh, and in visual localization, there has been a lot of progress in the last couple of years. Uh, and a lot of this has been fueled by it. We have very well-defined benchmarks. Uh, we sort of clear uh, query mapping splits. We have, it's quite common to have uh, private ground truth poses. We have hidden ground truth. Uh, and you can only sort of send your query poses to a localization server, which then sort of evaluates how well it went. Uh, and we have sort of public leaderboards driving this as well. Uh, so if we look at the existing data sets we have, we can sort of split them into what type or sort of like a, a taxonomy of like different characteristics. Uh, so this is generally like, is it is an, an indoor data set? Is it an outdoor data set? The scale of the data set? A lot of data sets are like room scale, but there are a few that goes up to like city scale. So this is the city of Aachen or like a part of a city of Aachen, I guess. Um, 
if you have a static environment, so if all of your images were captured like in a homogeneous uh, kind of way, like all looks similar, uh, or if you have like a very dynamic capture uh, that you can have uh, differences in people moving around and uh, things in the scene changing, for example. Uh, diversity in viewpoints, for example, if you have like a car data set, typically the car is looking along the road. So you have a very limited set of viewpoints to the scene. You always have buildings on the sides and you have road ahead, for example. Uh, or in this kind of photo tourism data sets over here, uh, even though they were captured by, by random tourists, like there is a set of canonical viewpoints for each landmark that people tend to capture. Um, so you get a lot of images, but a lot of them look very similar. Of course, with uh, different cameras and different illuminations, but uh, it was still like there is a, a certain distribution to the viewpoints you get. Uh, or you can have like more arbitrary, like typically in this kind of slam data sets, you have more uh, free form uh, movement. Uh, and then uh, for the motions, as I as you saw before on the images, there is a lot of difference whether I, I as a tourist captured my landmark like this, or if I have like a camera that's attached uh, to someone's head, because you have very quick rotations when you move around and you might move very close to walls and things like this, uh, versus cars, which essentially they're always driving down the road, seldom are they. Uh, looking anywhere else uh, versus handheld, which is typically downward facing, right? When we hold up our devices, we tend to uh, like hold them uh, tilted forward, right? Because we're looking at the screen. Uh, so the camera generally captures like a downward facing um, uh, image. Uh, so we did some sort of, we looked around at the different data sets that were used in visual localization and sort of looked at what kind of properties they had. And we found that none of them really fits this augmented reality setting um, very well. So this was the motivation for introducing our new data set. So this is the uh, Lamar data set. Uh, so this was a paper we had at ECCV, so the European Conference of Computer Vision, uh, which was a couple of weeks ago in uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, and we have a website, lamar.ethz.ch. Um, and the motivation for this was really, how do we capture a more realistic data set that we can use for benchmarking for augmented reality? Uh, so like how well do our current methods even work in this setting, right? Because um, like currently like a lot of the uh, benchmarking is done in this sort of photo tourism setting where you have like nice looking images and they're all upright and they're all looking towards the object. Uh, and this is a bit uh, un unrealistic for the applications that we are interested in. Uh, so just to give an overview. So in the initial release, we will have, well, we have three, uh, three scenes. We have one is a, uh, an, a, an office building at ETH. One is a uh, sort of old university building and one is like, um, the uh, downtown of some old city or, or of Zurich. I can say Zurich now, I guess. Um, so the uh, uh, the scenes are roughly like 150 meters squared. Um, some are a bit larger. Uh, and for all of these scenes, we ask users to run around with uh, either this Microsoft HoloLens 2 or uh, iPhones and iPads. So all of these trajectories you see here, so this is a subset of trajectories that we have registered uh, to the scene. And for these devices, we captured, uh, we captured the images from the uh, multi-camera rig, we captured uh, the uh, uh, RGB and the, I, the iPad Pro, I think has also the, the depth camera, uh, as well as radio signals, IMU, whatever the, uh, the interfaces allowed us to expose, we sort of tried to capture. Uh, and then for ground truthing, we use this sort of high quality laser scanners to generate uh, really high quality reconstructions of listens. Uh, so let's look a bit about the raw data. So the capture process was essentially crowdsourced, um, sort of. Uh, we gave AR devices to 20 non-expert users and we asked them, we gave some like uh, a map and we said like this rough area is where you're allowed to walk and just ask them to walk around in this area. They should do like, inspect things, walk around. We don't have any AR interactions. Like we don't ask them to 
uh, wave around their hands in the air or something like this. But we just said like, walk around and look at things roughly. Um, uh, and for the two devices, I said we had HoloLens 2 and uh, iPhones and uh, iPads. Uh, and for this, we, we, get, we get the cameras, of course, we get the depth sensors, but we also get the tracking from the devices. So for HoloLens 2, it's their proprietary uh, tracking algorithm. So we get poses from the local tracking uh, and for we get poses from ARKit for uh, iPhone 8 and uh, iPad Pro. Um, so we also, for every scene, we computed LiDAR references. So we uh, got these uh, Navis devices. So Navis is some startup and they build these kind of uh, uh, scanning devices, which essentially has a bunch of cameras and lighters on them. And you walk around and it sort of builds uh, a nice looking LiDAR map based on doing some kind of proprietary LiDAR slam. Uh, we did some evaluations of this and it seems to be uh, quite accurate. So we had two different devices, this trolley. So you stand over here and you push it around. Uh, but this was a bit cumbersome when we wanted to walk upstairs. So we also got one of these, uh, yeah, I don't know, that backpacks, we call them. Uh, so you essentially have one lighter over here doing like a, a vertical scanning like this and one lighter over here doing uh, horizontal sweeps. And then it also has a bunch of cameras. Uh, and roughly, so the large scenes were captured in multiple one and a half hour sessions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is the type of output you would get. So this is the LiDAR point cloud from the ETH main building. And these are crops from the uh, fisheye cameras on the uh, Navis devices. So we would walk around and every two or three meters, we would trigger um, the cameras. We would get this type of images every two or three meters while the LiDAR was running continuously. Uh, and they also do, uh, the Navis devices also do some kind of post-processing of this to remove, for example, dynamic objects from the point cloud. Like if people were moving around uh, inside of the lighters, uh, they would sort of filter these out based on consistency from multiple views. A question, Victor? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so what, what kind of ground truths are, are collected here? Do you collect the sort of where the position of, of the iPad when, when the iPad walks around? Uh, yeah, yes. So this, so for every, uh, so I will get to this in a little bit, but for every, okay. we register, the goal okay. is to register all of the, all of the AR devices to these LiDAR maps. Uh, so we essentially have poses for every frame uh, for this. Uh, but this this lidar this is used to make sure we get uh, an accurate ground truth. So this is sort of like to help us register all of the AR devices to the same coordinate system. We leverage these lidars uh, because these are much more accurate than what we would get from uh, the cameras alone. Um, yeah. So the three different scenes they were essentially one of the office buildings at ETH. So this is the computer science department. Uh, where we have uh, multiple floors, we have indoor and outdoor. Uh, we have the main building of ETH Zurich. So this is a very old uh, building. Um, and then we have uh, the old, uh, old city or old town of Zurich, uh, which is only outdoors. Uh, wait. Uh, so here we can look at the, um, the office building and we see we have five floors captured here. So here we see some of the trajectories registered. We can see there is a lot of repetitions here. For example, these two are from different floors, but visually they are quite similar. Uh, we have this kind of like uh, computer labs, for example, which is very, very messy. We have a messy uh, kitchen area, some office. We have a lot of corridors, which are quite challenging for uh, visual localization because we have a lot of sort of like visual aliasing where sort of everything looks the same, but like shifted. Uh, by one door, right? Um, and all of, of course, you have like these kind of corridors on multiple floors, uh, and it's quite different, quite difficult even for humans. If you, even if you've been to this building a lot of times, if you get a picture like this, you have very few sort of distinctive points that you can use to sort of localize where you are. Um, uh, we also have some outdoors. So this is essentially walking around uh, the building. And if you worked with the ETH 3D data set, uh, that was like five or six years ago. So this is the facade scene from that data set. And this is the courtyard scene uh, 
if you work with this I don't know um, for the main building we have a lot of symmetry um, so these two images are actually captured in different places of the buildings so the, the building is essentially symmetric over here um, so these are on, on on opposite sides and I could honestly not tell you which side is which even though I've been in this building many times um, and similar here this is also symmetric and we have a lot of these sort of repetitive elements in the structure, which also makes it very difficult. Um, yeah, we have the corridors as well. And we have also outside this uh, building, so you can see sort of nice, and uh, like all of these images are renderings from the mesh we get from LiDAR. Uh, so the meshes look um, quite good. We were quite happy with this. For downtown Zurich, we have uh, yeah, it looks like downtown Zurich, we have very narrow uh, corridors like this. So these are difficult because when you have these devices, you walk close to the walls and they're essentially looking uh, directly, see like nothing but like um, the walls next to you. Uh, and then you sort of need to localize based only on the front facing cameras. Uh, and we captured this over quite a long time. So we started uh, like two and a half years ago. Uh, and like for the different scenes, it's been like one and a half year to two and a half year capture. Most of the uh, uh, AR device sequences were captured in like in bursts every few months. So we would go out, capture a lot of data, then we would wait a few months and then come back and capture a lot of data. Uh, and the LiDAR scans we did roughly every year or so, because these were a bit more time consuming than just asking some interns or students to run around with uh, the AR, AR devices. Uh, we have a lot of, um, since we have this large temporal extent, we have a lot of changes. For example, this was during COVID. So they started sort of uh, organizing uh, exam desks in the main hall of this uh, main building. Uh, and for example, we would also have like in these computer halls, of course, like everything would move around on the desks. And they also started some construction site, uh, like when renovations of the main building entrance during this time. So we got a lot of uh, geometry changes as well uh, during our capture. Um, and we have sort of, you can see this is sort of like shows the device coverage we have for the HoloLens 2 and the phones uh, for these two scenes. So if we now compare this data set with the, uh, with the existing data sets, we have both indoor and outdoor, we have a lot of different variations. It's quite large. We have roughly 45,000 square meters. Uh, which roughly corresponds to like 40 kilometers of walked, like the trajectories are roughly 40 kilometers of walk the distance, uh, which is quite a lot. And we have, like the data we have is very, uh, very well mimics the sort of actual augmented reality use cases for this. So people are looking around the things, they are sort of walking around aimlessly, uh, which can be very challenging for localization. Um, and we have a lot of sensor data, which sort of sets us apart from uh, many of these other data sets. Uh, so what do we do once we have collected all of this data? So we want to register everything to the same uh, coordinate frame. Uh, so what we do is we take our, um, uh, our uh, images from the Navis and from the air devices, and we do anonymization. So we blur all of the faces, we blur all of the license plates. Uh, and then we do uh, uh, we do meshing and we do scan registration. So we register the Navis LiDAR point clouds together. Uh, and then we try to register the sequences uh, to this. And this is first done per sequence and then sort of jointly uh, optimized. Um, and sort of the idea between, behind this sort of ground truthing process is that we wanna have, we trust the LiDAR slam the most. Um, and we, but we also want to fuse sort of the local tracking poses from the uh, devices because these are usually reliable locally, but they drift long term, right? Um, so we assume the lighter poses are uh, accurate, but the VI poses we sort of just take as uh, software constraints. And all of this process is entirely automated. So we have no manual annotations, we have no fiducial markers. Uh, in the scene, but this sort of we just put in all of the data and outcomes poses. Of course, we do a lot of like uh, manual verification afterwards, sort of looking that things look all right, but the process itself is very hands off, uh, which was, was our aim as well, because if you want to do anything large scale, 
uh, it needs to be like this. Um, so the scan is essentially we do uh, matching on the fisheye images. Uh, we lift to 3D with the mesh, and then it's like a robust registration project uh, process with Ransack and ICP. So here we can see uh, different uh, LiDAR scans that we've then sort of co-registered uh, into a single uh, LiDAR scan. And then for the AR devices, I will not go into detail about how it works, but just say we very, very carefully register them uh, to the LiDAR country. Uh, and if you want, want more details, you can ask me later or uh, you can read the paper as well. Uh, and then we take everything, we put it into a giant optimization problem and we optimize everything together. Um, and this gives us uh, very accurate poses. So essentially for all of the, um, for every frame captured by the augmented reality devices, we have accurate ground truth poses. And since we have the mesh, we also get uh, depth. We can just project the mesh into the into the images. And of course, we get uh, uh, normals as well, or whatever uh, you can get from the mesh, right? Uh, and like, we don't have a lot of quantitative uh, motivation for why our ground truth is very accurate. But we can do things like look at uh, rendering the mesh versus uh, looking at the images, right? So you can see this is the mesh, for example, and this is the actual image. And if you look here, like it seems to align quite well uh, when we sort of uh, switch between them. So we are we are quite confident that um, the the ground truth is quite accurate. Like the poses for the devices are quite accurate because we do this kind of visual inspection. Um, in addition, we have other data. So we have, for example, we know what are the indoors and outdoor. We have floor plans. Uh, so for every part of the sequence, we know when are we indoor, when are we walking outdoor and stuff like this. Um, so what might you use this data for? Well, we obviously want to use it for benchmarking, localization, mapping. This has been sort of the, the goal of the entire talk. Um, and we use this. Uh, so the LIDAR ground truth is only used for ground truthing purposes. And then for localization mapping, we sort of split all of the AR sequences into mapping and uh, query. So we have all of the mapping is done with uh, AR devices and all of the uh, and queries are AR devices as well, of course. And then by adjusting like the overlap between the map and the query, you can make this as hard or easy uh, as you want. So we have some heuristic method for sort of deciding which sequences should be mapping and which should be query to make it uh, sufficiently challenging, right? Uh, so here you can see like one of these splits, uh, for example. And we get some actually, some quite difficult queries. So here we see the uh, an example of a query image together with the, the map images that has the most overlap. And some of these are not uh, obvious at the start, for example, like this one is looking at this region here, for example. Uh, here we have a uh, cross device. So this is a, an, an iPhone image versus a HoloLens. We have day versus night, for example. We have very different viewpoints, uh, sort of like looking like this, which makes uh, matching quite uh, tricky. Um, now, we did not evaluate these sort of end-to-end -end learning based localization methods because they are generally uh, have only been shown to work for very small scenes, like room scale scenes. And it's not clear how to do it for larger scales. There are some like ESAC and stuff like this that tries to extend to larger scenes, but so far uh, not on this uh, scale. Uh, but I think we think one of the use cases could be like really push for these methods to also look at larger scale things and hopefully uh, make some progress uh, there as well, because they work quite well for uh, these very uh, small constraint settings. Uh, we could also do it for evaluating odometry and SLAM. This was not our goal, but we have essentially sequences with very accurate posts. Uh, so this might be interesting for people working on like visual odometry and SLAM. Uh, you could also use it for evaluating dense 3D reconstruction because we have poses with uh, the mesh from the LiDAR. Uh, something that's sort of missing from a lot of MVS and dense reconstruction is when you have different cameras and when you have different conditions. So if you want to create a dense reconstruction, but some of your images were taken uh, at day and some at night or like evening, 
Uh, this usually doesn't work so well for MVS uh, because they usually have like a very homogeneous set of images to work with. Uh, so, so this is like an interesting uh, research direction, I think. Uh, and also a lot of high bright noise vision is regarding use synthesis and rendering. Uh, and this might be an interesting uh, data set to look like if you want to do like very large scale nerves, uh, for example. Uh, so the data is released for localizations. So we have released mapping and query sets sort of with poses. We plan to release the full data uh, later. So everything from the LiDAR, all like full FPS data for all of the cameras. Uh, however, we want to keep this a little bit so that we have like a private ground truth, because of course, if you have the full data, you can regenerate the ground truth we had, uh, and this would sort of uh, beat the purpose for the localization benchmark, perhaps. Uh, and we have like a permissive license uh, for all of this that allows commercial use. Now we had some limitations that we realized when we captured the data. So uh, iOS doesn't ex uh, expose the full radios, uh, which we realized at some point <laughs> during the data capture. Uh, so we cannot record Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth beacons. Um, we get anonymized Bluetooth, which we could not match to the Bluetooth from the other devices, uh, which was a bit annoying. Uh, the ground treating process, we assume it's sort of perfect, but it's not always. Um, uh, and there are some other things in the ground treatment process that could be improved. Uh, and we have plans to do this as well, but we think that the ground truth is quite good, like just from visual um, inspection of the renderings, but uh, it can definitely be improved as well. Also, the meshing we use is not perfect. Uh, so any progress on like large scale, robust meshing of LiDAR point clouds, this would be very helpful for us um, because we tried a lot of things and yeah. There is room to improve for sure. Uh, so let's finally talk a little bit about the results, the limitations, and the uh, open problems. So uh, we focused on evaluating these sort of structure-based localization methods. Uh, so these were the ones where you do uh, image retrieval, and then you do matching to the retrieved images, and then you sort of get 2D, 3D correspondences like transitively by matching to your map images. Uh, so one of the main things is how you do the matching, right? So we looked at different approaches going from more like classical SIFT plus, uh, so ADALAM is like a classical uh, outlier filter uh, versus like combinations of classical and learned methods to like fully learned detectors, descriptors, and matchers. Uh, for dense matching, we use Lofter, uh, which is a, a good representative of the state-of-the-art dense matcher. Uh, and for image retrieval, there is not really any classical method that is competitive with NetVlad, so we just use NetVlad and uh, a fusion-based approach that uses both NetVlad and uh, APGEM. Um, so we uh, we recorded radios as well, and currently, like in the vision community, there's no really good um, localization visual localization pipeline that includes radios. Uh, so we had to come up with some baseline here. Uh, so the main things we record are sort of when we receive the radio, uh, the uh, identifier of the endpoint, so the MAC address or the Bluetooth GUID, uh, as well as sort of signal, signal strength, so how far away are we from the radio. Uh, and radios turn out to be quite useful because they are very uh, spatially bounded. Like if I, take, if I take an image, I can see buildings which are very far away, but might not be useful for uh, doing my localization. Or they might give me like a rotation estimate, but if I want to get my position correct, a building that is a couple of kilometers away, this is not going to help me at all. Um, so radios sort of help us giving us some spatial idea of where we are in the map. So here you can see like from two, um, two radio endpoints of sort of the signal strength we get uh, for the different images. Uh, so the way we tried to incorporate this into this hierarchical visual localization pipeline was to use it to guide the image retrieval. Uh, we have uh, simple baselines. We take essentially, we create uh, radio descriptors. So for each dimension, we store the signal strength to a specific endpoint. So if we have a thousand Wi-Fi wi endpoints, we would have a thousand dimensional descriptor. Um, and then, so these descriptors are used for retrieval. Uh, so 
we the cameras and radio signals are not synchronized so we sort of aggregate in a window around each frame uh, so it's two seconds forwards and backwards or for queries it's only uh, backwards of course um, and then to in integrate this we create a, a voxel grid uh, the size of the map and we store the descriptors these radio descriptors uh, in each voxel grid and when we do retrieval, we find the two and a half percent of voxel grids that have the most similar radio descriptor, and we restrict the image retrieval to only look in this region. Uh, so it's, it's essentially just guiding the image retrieval to areas which have the most similar radio signals. Um, and then for the evaluation, we look at like different ways to split this data. So we have uh, single images, single rigs. So this would be like using all of the four cameras, for example, on the HoloLens, uh, or like sequential data. So we have like a sequence we're trying to localize. And then with and without radios, and like depending on how we do the map. So if we build the map from AR images, or if we build it uh, using the mesh, right? Um, and then like the results, we can sort of split into different buckets. Like, are we querying with the HoloLens? Are we doing it at night, are we outdoor, et cetera. Um, so I will not go through all of the evaluation results. I'll just show you some of the highlights. But if you're uh, more interested, you can look in the paper as well. Um, so for the metrics for this localization, we look at localization recall at some threshold in the error in translation rotation. Uh, we chose 10 centimeters, one degree, which is um, a good target for AR applications in the sense that it's probably the most you can tolerate. Uh, and it's also quite difficult for current methods. Um, so of course you want uh, you want it to be lower, but I think this is a good metric to give some useful signal for what we should improve. We also looked a bit at a higher threshold, so one meter five degrees. The reason for this was that these are poses, like poses that satisfy this threshold, but not the previous one, are roughly in the right spot and they're roughly seeing the right things. So these are images we think we could improve on by just getting a better match, right? Because we have we probably have visual overlap with the correct images at this point. While if you're outside this threshold, you probably want to look at your image retrieval and improve this. Uh, there are a lot of metrics for visual localization. You can do like perceptive metrics and stuff like this. We decided to focus only on localization recall because um, it's a bit easier to interpret, but of course, to the online leaderboard, we might add more metrics uh, later. Uh, so if you look a bit at uh, how these different features perform, so this is for single image localization, uh, we can see, so this is this recall at the tight threshold for different image retrieval and different key point detectors and matchers. Uh, we can see sort of the trend that these fully learned um, methods are performing quite a bit better than the completely classical. Though there are like, uh, some of the learned methods are similar in performance to fully classical. So what really makes a difference here is that we have a, a learned matter. So there's a, uh, a neural network that performs the matching instead of just doing descriptor similarity. And there is a lot to gain there um, compared to just doing nearest neighbor. Uh, we did a, some evaluations for like how much does this radio filter help? Uh, and we saw that it gives sort of a consistent improvement. So these are like taking the top five images, taking the top 10, taking the top 20. So again, like higher here is better. Um, uh, so we see that we get a consistent improvement, but there is still um, a lot of improvement left. So this is the ground truth overlap based on using the mesh to sort of figure out how much of how much visual overlap do these images have? So just retrieving the, the top 10 images based on this visual overlap will give us a much better result. Now to evaluate sequences, you need to start thinking about like how long is a sequence, right? Um, because this uh, will, um, your recall will depend a lot on this. So in this graph, we show the recall at different sequence length uh, going back from the starting frame. So this is the recall for the last frame with different history lengths. Uh, and as you in increase the length, it sort of gets easier to localize and the recall goes up. Uh, so what you can do in this graph is you can sort of flip it on its end and start thinking about how long does it take to reach 70% uh, recall? 
So what is the time to recall at 70%? And in this case, it's less than one second. What is the time to recall at 75 and it's less than two, but you can sort of get an idea of how quickly can we localize. Uh, and this is useful, of course, in AR because when the user puts on their device and starts it, they want to localize as quickly as possible. They don't want to wait 30 seconds to go. Uh, like we want to localize with as little data as possible. Uh, and you can sort of split this into different uh, performance and HoloLens. And we see that if we include uh, radios, we get a significant boost. And if you look at like at, uh, time to recall 80%, it goes from like infinitely to uh, less than two seconds. So there is a lot of room for improvement uh, in this type of metric. Now, just to give uh, a summary of the results, I will very shortly be done, don't worry. Um, so if we just look at pure single image localization, uh, we can localize around 45% of the queries for HoloLens. If we look at not only like a single image, but doing like a full rig localization, so using the fact that we know that these four images were taken uh, like from this particular configuration um, from the HoloLens, uh, we get quite a significant boost. Of course, a lot of this comes from just uh, like if you're standing close to a wall, like one of the cameras doesn't see anything interesting and this camera cannot be localized. While if the other cameras might see very uh, distinctive points and sort of can help localize uh, a rig. If we include radios, we get a uh, significant boost. And if we go to sequences over images, we get further boost. And again, including radios on top of the sequences, uh, it gets even better. Now, sort of the single image case, this is typically what is evaluated in visual organization. And we argue that this is artificially hard. Uh, like it's very pessimistic to do localization based on a single image. And we think there should be more focus on sort of doing localization from these sequences and also trying to fuse other sensors. Uh, now, while these numbers might seem quite high, we believe every, um, every image in our query set is localizable in the sense that it has overlap with some of the mapping images. Um, so we believe that it should be possible to localize every single query. So there is still work to be done in this area. Uh, so quickly about the limitations. So I said that we could not record the uh, radio signals for Bluetooth uh, for iOS because it doesn't expose them. It only exposes anonymized uh, uh, ide anonymized identifiers that we couldn't match to the other sensors. Um, so what we did in the end is that we uh, transferred uh, radio signals from nearby uh, HoloLens rigs. We have like a like a pseudo Bluetooth uh, pseudo radio data for the iOS devices, uh, but of course this uh, would have been better if it was from the actual device, as they might have very different characteristics. Uh, we only consider like a small subset of the possible uh, possible baselines. We will have an, an open uh, sort of evaluation server that you can submit your own uh, things, uh, and hopefully uh, people will submit their favorite matcher or their favorite key point detector or whatever they are working on and evaluated there. Uh, global features we found out uh, work quite well. So these are the image descriptors for image retrieval. However, there is a lot of bias to retrieving same device rather than same scene. So if I take an RGB image from my phone, it prefers to retrieve phone images rather than HoloLens images that were taken uh, at the same point. Uh, of course, they were sort of trained uh, with very similar looking images. So this is something that might just be corrected by training on a different training set. Uh, but this is something that should be uh, investigated. Uh, also, we retrieve a lot of images, um, but ideally you should be able to retrieve fewer images like five or so and then match to the top five, right? Uh, and this would potentially um, be faster and just uh, better if we would have better image, image retrieval. Uh, for local features, we saw that having a learned matcher, so super glue in this case, improves a lot. However, uh, super glue is really only available for uh, super point key points and it would be super useful to have like a, a super glue framework for other key points or ideally key point uh, agnostic super glue would be uh, extremely useful. And also we found in the benchmark that the detection accuracy, so sort of the accuracy of the 2D key point matters a lot. 
uh, mapping from multiple devices, like mapping cross devices hard, and there's definitely work to do there. Um, also doing like, we saw that using the mesh can be improved things. So of course in the, in the real settings, you don't have the LiDAR mesh, so you would need something else. Uh, but uh, having MVS methods that work cross device and sort of cross conditions would be useful as well. Uh, and of course, we want the sort of time to recall uh, to be as low as possible, uh, but there's still definitely a lot of work left. Okay, thanks for thanks for listening. I think I went a little bit over time, but not too much, I hope. Thank you, Vincor. No problem. Do we have some questions from the audience? Um, I can I can ask a question about uh, about the evaluation. So 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 this uh, recall at uh, sort of a given uh, given given accuracy, right? Yeah. Uh, so it means you make a prediction, one prediction per capture, uh, and whether or not that is within ten centimeters and one degree, and that's a true positive. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially like what what percentage of poses were within this accuracy, and then we can see like how long do our sequence need to be to be at this recall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it might not be possible. Like uh, like if you have a high enough threshold there, that like this time might be infinite, right? It's not because this curve doesn't necessarily increase monotonically. Uh, like um, you could have that this caps out at some point and even goes down depending on your um, depending on your localization algorithm because right? this is only measuring for the for the final frame or for the first frame I guess because it goes backwards in time. Mm -hmm. So we have a question in the chat uh, from Johan. Uh, did you try to use the uh, magnetometer for the position? Uh, we have not that... used this, no, uh, but this would be interesting as well. I. I've heard some people use uh, magnetometers for um, positioning things, but uh, no, we did not. Um, I don't know what kind of, like, we tried to record as much as possible of the sensors we got. Um, I don't have a, like a complete list of what we, what we got, unfortunately. <laughs> I um, had a related question to this uh, length of the sequences discussion you had. So, um, I, I, I mean, intuitively, you would think that longer sequences makes it easier, uh, uh, which is kind of matched by your graphs here. Yeah. Uh, but I, I wonder how big is the cold start problem really? Because I guess you could bootstrap uh, cold starts by using, let's say, radio data for like initial localization and then from there it doesn't maybe it's not as important to have perfect localization in like the first few seconds but roughly correct and then yeah. the longer sequences you have the better it will be i think it depends a lot on the on the application like how important it is that you retrieve whatever like meta information that you have spatially around you as soon as possible like um yeah, it's hard to say like how, how important is it to localize within five seconds or not. But I yeah. can imagine as a user, if I turn on my um, my my headset and like I don't get anything localized within 30 seconds, I'm not, I'm not happy with this experience, I think. Uh, but of course you can do like coarse localization, but really if you need to place virtual objects in the scene, I like even if I know roughly where I am, I cannot just start placing them right. Uh, I need like quite accurate poses before I can start uh, like, yeah, visualizing pipes in the wall or whatever my application is. Uh, sure, I was, uh, uh, and I think it's all reasonable what you said. I'm just thinking like, if you're using an AR device for let's say two hours, the first 10 seconds doesn't matter in terms of your total experience. So building a problem that optimizes for the first 10 seconds rather than one that optimizes for the full experience is quite yeah. different, I assume. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, that depends. But like the full experience after this, like once we are localized, it's mainly about like local odometry and tracking, right? We sort of, we know where we are and it's like, 
But you can also imagine this in terms of like your localization might also be for drift correction labor. So if you have like this cloud-based localization and you want to send it some data to sort of figure out whether I have drifted or not, then right. this could be like you want to send as little data as possible, sort of pushing this sequence length uh, down. Perhaps. Right, then I get it. That, that yeah. makes sense. Great, thanks. Uh, hello, I have a question is that like I noticed that you use the IMU sensor and uh, this is for the assistance to localization or what's so, the function of the IMU? The IMU is used, so these devices, they do uh, visual inertial odometry, so they use the IMU to do the local tracking. Uh, we don't, um, so we use the poses from the visual inertial odometry inside the optimization when we do the ground truthing. Okay. Uh, we don't use the IMU uh, during localization, but you could do this as well. Like, for example, you can get like an estimate of the gravity direction, and this will then like restrict your search space, right? Because you know, uh, you essentially remove two degrees of freedom from the rotation. Uh, but we didn't do this, but uh, it's certainly something you can try and get uh, improvements from. Okay, thank you. And uh, I also noticed that uh, at the last uh, slide, you mentioned that that's for the future work. There exists like something improvement uh, of the robust to like multi device. This is means the robustness between the different sensors. I yeah. Mean, so it's essentially like if we do mapping with Hololens, whether we can localize with uh, iPhones because the images look quite different and they have very different characteristics. Like. Um, like in these images, for example. So a lot of the problem is that when we do image retrieval with phone images, it prefers to retrieve similar looking phone images rather than HoloLens images that are at the same spot. Um, so having methods that are robust to do this kind of uh, correspondence problems between, um, between sensors is definitely. And then of course there are other, like if you have different radios, uh, they might have different characteristics as well. Um, and making it work across, across devices is always difficult, I think. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, next week, we have uh, Sarah Beery visiting us. She's an associate professor at MIT, and she's going to talk about computer vision for, for ecology. So welcome back next week. That'll be December 2nd, I think. Perhaps. It's not that. All right. Thank you. Bye.